Our next conversation is our Health Friday conversation. This Friday, uh, we have invited Dr. Manuel Haj. She is a consultant medical oncologist at the Aga Khan University Hospital. Dr. Harry, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Thank you so much. That's the hot seat of the Situation Room. How does it feel? Uh, I like it. I yeah. like the pink microphones. Very good. <laughs> mm. Very good. You're here to talk to us about testicular cancer because it's about the awareness on testicular cancer this month. Many people don't know what that means. I include I'm not sure exactly what where does testicular begin, where does it end and where does the other one what do you want to say there? Prostate. That one. Where yeah. does it begin? Where does it end? And which other which one do you want? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. To welcome you to this conversation, Doc. Um, on behalf of our colleague CT, I'll have the day's proverb. So every week we bring proverbs from one African country and a proverb a day from that country. This week our focus has been on the Kingdom of Morocco. You know that country? I know it very well. Have you been there? I have been there. Have mm -hmm. you grown up there? No, I've <laughs> grown up in a neighborhood country mm -hmm. in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've, have you visited Morocco? Yes. Yeah. Give us three cities that you've been to. Um, I've just been to one, Marrakesh. Mm. Marrakesh. Sounds very good, eh? Yes, it does. It sounds, you know, it's a mix, it like you said, like a mix of <laughs> modern and uh, traditional yeah. cultural city. What was your experience in Marrakesh? Um, it was like a dream, you know, everything was like a fairy tale. Everything is presented as a fairy tale. It's like you're going to meet Aladdin when you step out into the street. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually we almost met it in Marrakesh <laughs> in one oh. of the shows. So, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Good one. Our proverb for today uh, says, and I want you to listen and can give us your own interpretation of that proverb. If you are responsible for a problem, you should find the solution. If you are responsible for a problem, you should find a solution. That's quite a, a good proverb. Mm. So that means um, that every problem, number one, has a solution. If you're the creator of that problem, then you should be able to solve it. So that's really some food for thought. Mm -hmm. And then um, it stimulates probably people uh, not to be waiting for, to be given the solutions and then to create your own path and have your own uh, demeanor to um, solve any issues. So mm -hmm. that's basically uh, a booster for uh, someone's personality and uh, someone's um, self-confidence. That's mm -hmm. a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a good interpretation. It's a pity, pity didn't, uh, CT didn't pick the uh, proverbs from Tunisia, but I think next week. They'll be from Tunisia. You can come back next week. Sure. And you'll help. <laughs> I'll with come with my proverb. <laughs> you'll come with a, with a Tunisian proverb. What is testicular cancer, Doc? All right. So uh, first of all, thanks for bringing uh, for bringing this subject to uh, to the light. You know, cancer is usually a taboo. People don't easily talk about cancer, and you can imagine for testicular cancer in particular. And then the timing is really perfect. This month is uh, awareness, the month of awareness for testicular cancer. So testicular cancer is not really a common cancer it just represents one percent of all cancers mm. but then it's one of the commonest cancers for male mm. so especially at the age uh, between 15 to 35 years old so those are yeah, young patients young male mm. uh, who can have a testicular cancer and then they might not be realizing it so um, usually it starts with a swelling an abnormal swelling mm. on the testicle and then it's usually painless. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, the, the person might not feel comfortable reaching out to a doctor or even to family members or friends and talk about that swelling that they have noticed on the testicle. Uh, you know, it's a private, uh, it's in the private area. So people don't really um, feel the need or don't feel comfortable to talk to someone about that swelling. Mm. Um, and then the fact that it's painless, majority of the cases, make them feel comfortable, uh, take their time thinking about what's going on in their body mm. before they reach out to someone when you say a swelling mm -hmm. what what how does the swelling look like is it the swelling of both testicles is it the swelling of the testicular sac 
Is it a pimple that grows? What is it? So a swelling could be a nodule, like mm. just a hard nodule or a firm nodule on palpation. Could be a nodule mixed with some inflammation of the sac. Uh, could be just inflammation of the sac and then you're wondering what's happening and then the nodule is a bit deep there. Mm -hmm. So um, it could be a bump, a lump, an inflammation. Um, few cases also it can be painful. It doesn't mean that it has always, uh, it will always be a uh, painless swelling. So mm -hmm. some, in few cases it's a bit also like um, just a bit of pain. Sometimes the patient will say, I just felt a bit of heaviness down there. Mm. So just feeling heavy, not being able to palpate the nodule. Sometimes the partner is the one who feels that there is um, an abnormal uh, lump mm. uh, and reports it. Mm. Yeah. Does it continue growing? Or? Yes, it's usually a tumor that uh, uh, that is progressively growing. Mm. Um, like I said, majority of the cases pain-free. Mm. So it's a dynamic uh, process mm. that starts one day and then continues growing. Yeah. So by the time this particular tumor has gotten to the point whereby if you palpate, you can feel it, does that mean then that uh, there would be the presence of cancer if it were not benign? Okay, let me rephrase that question. Can some of these nodules that you then find be benign? Yes, okay. uh, not any swelling means uh, means uh, a cancer, yeah. of mm. course. So um, it so when you have a swelling, I would encourage the the person to go and uh, seek medical attention. Uh, there will be some very straightforward and easy uh, investigations that will be done to be able to determine from a benign uh, a benign lesion from a malignant lesion, mm -hmm. and um, we can just start with some blood tests, some um, uh, scrotal ultrasound or testicular ultrasound, and then based on the findings on that ultrasound, we'll be able to assess uh, the malignant potential of that uh, lump. Yeah. You talked about 15 to 32. That's a very young age. Exactly. Yeah. The why, are we, why do we look at this? I mean, it, I was actually shocked when you talked about that. And I said, wow, for other cancers, we'll see that they, they you know, we see them at a, at a later stage in life, yeah. men and women. Why so young? So, you know, that's, that's um, the, maybe I would say the, um, the common thinking about cancer, it will happen only for elderly patients. Mm. If it was the case, we wouldn't see kids in our clinics. Yeah. We wouldn't see young adults in our, in our clinics. Mm. So um, testicular cancer particularly, every cancer has a specific pattern mm -hmm. and has a specific um, um, population. Testicular cancer is for the young adults. So that's why on an average it's between 15 and 35. And unlike the common population where they feel surprised that the, the age is a bit young, mm. as physicians, as doctors, we would be surprised if um, an older adult comes with a testicular cancer. So that's the average, but then it can happen uh, a bit earlier and mm. then it can happen a bit later as well. Okay. Yeah. What causes it at this age? That's a good question. So uh, testicular cancer has some risk factors. And uh, here I want to emphasize about one particular uh, risk factor mm. for the parents to be aware of it the undescendant testicles if your child has undescendant testicles please do not hesitate to do a regular follow-ups especially when they become a bit um, when they reach you know uh, puberty um, and the testicles remain undescendant so those ones need particular attention because that's one uh, of the most known risk factors for testicular cancer mm -hmm. you know if God created testicles um, as an external organ it was really for a reason. It, it, it's for um, allowing the male to have fertility, number one. Number two, because uh, those, um, uh, the gonads cannot survive a temperature of 37, the normal body temperature. So they have to be external and then to be on a kind of room air temperature. Mm. Yeah, so undescended testicle is one of those uh, most important risk factors for testicular cancer. But then also having a family history of testicular cancer in particular and then any other uh, type of cancer. Mm. The patient who had previously a uh, history of testicular cancer uh, can still be, that can still be considered as a risk factor for having another testicular cancer. Yeah. Can, can we go into that just a little bit? Undescended testicles, what would be the reason? Is there a reason for that? Why wouldn't they descend at the time when they were meant to? 
Yeah, you know, during the pregnancy uh, and during the the fetal uh, growth, uh, few steps are made from day one of pregnancy up to the end of the pregnancy. So uh, there is a sequencing of events that should happen. Uh, uh, so that at the end we have a healthy baby mm -hmm. and, you know, we have the normal anatomy that every uh, human has. So sometimes during those process, few things happen, like, for example, um, just another example uh, to mention why sometimes the testicles are undescended. So, for example, a malrotation of the stomach. Sometimes her patients are born with the stomach on the right side instead of being on the left side. Mm -hmm. So during this fetal formation, uh, sometimes few steps do not complete 100% what is supposed to happen mm -hmm. mm. okay what is this what is an undescended testicle it's a testicle that is not in the scrotal sac it's a testicle that remains within the pelvis or sometimes in the abdomen abdominal ca cavity so uh, when the baby is born um, one of the most important pediatricians exam is to check if the testicles are in place mm -hmm. so and actually you will f you will see it in that small booklet that would be given to the parents it's really an important thing to check mm. on day one of life okay. so uh, the pediatrician or even the mom will be usually able to pick it up when they palpate the scrotal sac they will find it empty and you would know you would if know you were to so the you sac is there but it's there. empty yes it's okay. empty like just i mean allow me to use some layman words mm. the balls are not inside the sacks mm. yeah so it's empty and this is visible this is something that you look at and it's visible it's visible and then uh, it's palpable you can feel it okay yeah. mm. so if this is something that you can just pick out at the mm. moment that the baby is born and you've mm. identified it's a boy you've identified it's a boy because you've looked at their uh, genital parts so you can see that there is you you can see that there's a sack but then the balls are not in the sack like you said so you can pick it out immediately. Exactly. So, and so is is can this be corrected immediately? So uh, the pediatrician uh, surgeon will talk, or the pediatrician will talk to the to the parents. They will of course connect them to a surgeon, and then these can be planned. So uh, this is an issue that can be easily fixed, and it's a planned surgery. So in agreement with the parents and the surgeon, these will be fixed. But the problem is, you know, sometimes people give birth uh, not in a health system. Mm. And and, you know, probably sometimes not everyone would access, you know, the regular follow up in a pediatrician with a pediatrician or they are not regular on their vaccines because all of those are multiple occasions yeah. to pick up what was missed on the day of birth. So mm -hmm. like even let's say, for example, it wasn't picked up because the mom has given birth at home with the help with the midwife mm -hmm. or um, it can always be picked up on those regular checkups. And every time a kid go to the hospital for a fever or for any other reason, this is part. Is, this is a major part of uh, examination. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, we might do some physiology here just to understand exactly what's going on. So, with now testicular cancer, we are saying that there is cancer of the testicle, right? And we're also saying that a high risk um, demographic is young men who have undescended testicles high risk mm -hmm. okay so in the presence of cancer now if the testicle is undescended where is this cancer manifesting so in an ideal scenario if someone has an undescended testicle th this would have been fixed before reaching the age of uh adulthood mm. through surgery or whatever. yes okay yeah but those but then this is actually uh, why it's good to increase the awareness so mm. like i would encourage the people who are listening to us today and if they know that they have undescended uh, testicles and they've never sought any medical attention maybe it's a good time to go and and be checked yeah because mm. it would be more difficult actually to pick up um, uh, testicle cancer on an undescended testicle and we see it in our clinics basically sometimes those patients this particular subgroup of patients they come with advanced disease mm -hmm. and that's what we actually want to avoid we want to uh, have people uh, consulting us and seeking our help 
at a very early stages mm. when it's um, I mean testicle cancer is one of the most curable cancers that's mm. something I also want to emphasize mm. that it's 95% uh, people are cured from this testicular cancer but then also it's always better if you pick it at a very early stage where surgery will only be the treatment that you will need mm. so that you don't really need to go through chemo or mm. radiation or so yeah I think that's one of the most important messages we should send to uh, to the young uh, people who are listening to us. If you have an anti testicle, please get yourself checked. Okay. Yeah. So what does the surgery entail? Cutting out the cancer or removing a part? So surgery for testicular cancer will uh, entail the removal of that testicle. Okay. So we start first of all with an ultrasound and then we check both testicles because having one testicle that could have a tumor, um, you need to check the opposite as well because in few cases we can see bilateral testicular cancer. So we have to check the opposite testicle as well. Now immediately you see a suspicious uh, tumor and here it's a message to all surgeons and in the cities, in up countries, wherever they practice. If there is a tumor in the testicle, go in for a surgery for a testicular cancer, mm. unless proven otherwise. Mm. Because the surgery also will, um, will have a role on the outcomes of the patient. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, has, it has to be a removal of the whole testicle, what you call orchidectomy, and it has its particular rules to be followed. So please, if there is any tumor in the testicle, go in for a testicular cancer, just do an inguinal orchidectomy and not cut through the scrotal sac, yeah, mm. to avoid having any spread, to do an oncological and um, a curative surgery, and to spare your patient any further complications in the near future. So going for a cancer, unless proven otherwise. How are we proving it otherwise? Mm. Once we remove the testicle, it will be analyzed in the lab and then under the microscope, the pathologist, the doctor behind the microscopes will be able to tell you this is a cancer or this is not, this was just a benign. And then you would have saved your patient, you would have avoided any further complications. But you've removed the testicle, mm -hmm. can you return it? You cannot return it, but you have uh. another testicle. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's at least, you know, um, the privilege of having uh, two mm. testicles. Any organ that does exist mm. in, uh, like, for example, the kidneys, it doubles. the it doubles, mm. you can just spare one. Yeah. So, yeah, patients will be able to continue having a normal life with just one testicle. Mm. Yeah. So the symptoms for this, you said, abnormal, abnormal swelling. Yes. Most times painless. Yes. And this will be in the form of a bump or a lump or a nodule. How does it progress? So the first time that somebody feels and they feel, well, there's a bump here. There's, and and so what should they do immediately? Or then if they don't do that, what's likely to happen next? That's good. So in few cases, in 2024, we are still seeing patients coming with advanced uh, stages. So that lump is ignored for years, and then the patient will come with uh, weight loss, uh, lack of appetite, mm. um, cough, a persistent cough, a back pain. That's already um, an alarm or a bell that was rung because uh, that means that uh, that tumor that was ignored for s for some years, months, has already spread. So we don't want to see any more patients coming with a persistent cough, with chest pain, sometimes even with convulsions when it spreads to the brain. Mm. So um, the natural history of that lump in the testicle, it will continue growing and then maybe might have some other lumps at the inguinal area on the, on the, groin, on the groin here. Mm. And then weight loss, cough, headaches, back pain, those are symptoms for advanced disease because if we don't treat uh, the local disease, it will uh, continue progressing uh, local regionally so that some few lymph nodes will appear and then mm. systemically mm. it can spread to the bones, to the lungs, to the, uh, to the brain. Mm. Yeah. And um, those are the symptoms that we don't want to see anymore in, our, in, in the clinics. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. With regularity, what are you seeing in terms of numbers? Um, you said, okay, 1% um, of all cancers, so it may be one of the rarer ones, but it is the most common amongst men. Uh, but what kind of numbers are we seeing? I mean, we see with cervical cancer, nine women are dying from cervical cancer every day. What numbers are we seeing with Kenya? Um, 
for testicular cancer? Yeah, it's not among the top 10 cancers mm -hmm. in Kenya. So like you've mentioned, cervical cancer is top two, breast cancer is top one. Uh, we have colon cancer. So testicular is not among those uh, top 10 cancers. Mm. Uh, in terms of numbers in Kenya, I wouldn't be able to give you uh, the figure, the correct figure, because we don't really have an accurate cancer registry. But it's it's not like on a daily basis in our uh, workplace, it's not the number one cancer that we see. Mm. Yeah. But if we receive a patient, a young gentleman, um, we usually, and then even if, like, for example, it starts with uh, some lung mass, sometimes it's picked up the other way around. Mm -hmm. Instead of picking up the testicular uh, cancer, the patient comes with chest pain or cough. You do an x-ray, you do a scan, you find some lesions. So when you receive a patient uh, around that group of age, it will be among the first diagnosis that someone should think of, and mm -hmm. then we should go back and examine the testicles. Yeah. Our Health Friday conversation this morning is creating awareness on testicular cancer. How, how much do you know about it? That's why we're here. Dr. Manel Haj is a consultant medical oncologist from the Aga Khan University Hospital. She's here to help us understand more about it. If you've got any question, post the questions on social media, Spice FM KE on X, Spice FM on Facebook, Spice FM on our live stream on YouTube, Spice FM KE on Instagram. All of them. If you've got any question, we'll pose it to the doc here. As doc is saying, well, it's not one of the even the top ten uh, um, in terms of the killer diseases, even in the country. So not many numbers, not many people know about it. But then there are people who may be in the ages of 15 to 35 who are at high risk of having testicular cancer. And how do you know that you've got it? Abnormal swelling. Uh, it's painless maybe a bump maybe a lump maybe some noodle somewhere and and this is how you see it number one doc what's the screening like for testicular cancer and number two you know we hear about breast cancers with the other you know external appendage we know that we are told both men and women keep feeling your breast and if you feel something abnormal then that's something to continue checking further what is it that we say about the balls all right. So, uh, you know, to put in place a screening strategy by the health system, it has to really have an impact on, you know, the resources, on the patients, over a survival and on, um, on like, it should be a health uh, problem. Mm. So testicular cancer is not among the top 10 cancers, as I said. It's not really um, a health problem. Um, and uh, you need to remember, and then I will keep um, emphasizing about that point, it's a curable cancer in 95% of the cases, mm. um, regardless of the stage. So sometimes even if the patient comes at a, at a late stage, mm. uh, he can still be cured, although he will go through more chemotherapies than someone who came at stage one, for mm. example, who would be spared any chemotherapy. But still, um, we can still cure these uh, category of cancers. Mm. So in terms of screening for um, testicular cancer, there isn't a particular strategy because overall the outcomes are good so there isn't really a strategy that you need to put in place for something that is not uh, affecting in a negative way uh, the population and the health system mm -hmm. but um, as, as you've just summarized again the symptoms um, maybe um, I would say we shouldn't be seeing any more undescended testicles that were not fixed. Mm. So uh, please uh, screen those young babies, um, screen those young kids, even if it wasn't picked up at an early uh, age mm. or when they were newborns, at least we can always screen them and check and then uh, pick it at a stage where it will not uh, be transformed to a testicular cancer. Um, also, there is another figure that we see quite often in our clinics. The the lump or the pump will be there, mm. but then uh, the young man will be playing soccer and then he, some trauma happens yep. and then the swelling uh, appears. Mm. So people will blame that trauma. Like, you know, I received my colleague's uh, shoe on mm. my testicles. I received the ball on my testicles. Mm. So uh, it's not really the factor that has caused that, but it might have triggered and it might have shown up that node that was sitting mm. uh, silently there. Mm. So sometimes we see it coming immediately after a trauma. So also after a trauma, don't consider uh, that that's just a testicular uh, um, uh, torsion or, you know, 
we have always to check, do an ultrasound, make sure that there is no abnormal swelling in there. Yeah. Mm. So, because now the screening aspect that we speak of, maybe not like that, maybe that we see with others, but then the regular, um, the regular checking. Is that something then that you say, if you do that regularly, then you would be able to see, it wouldn't just, or would it creep up on you one day that, okay, well, after the shower, and then I found something, mm. but wouldn't it, pro- wouldn't it be progressive? So if you felt regularly, you would know that something was, was abnormal? Um, or is it tricky? Is it it's, just- it's a bit tricky, you know, because that, we don't want also paranoia to be installed on people. Yeah. So, uh, for example, just, I mean, I'm... I'm hearing you, so I know that you're extrapolating a bit, for example, from the breast cancer, yes, mm. yes. where we all know that one lady out of eight will end up having a breast cancer. So that's why we emphasize on self-examination. We emphasize to go to a health care provider and do the uh, breast exam. We emphasize on a mammogram every year, starting from the age of 40. Mm. For testicular cancer, number one, it's not that frequent. It's not that common. But um, I wouldn't say, like, do regular checkups. Someone will not be, you know, like, it doesn't uh, happen that commonly but if there are any risk f- factors like you know family history uh, of testicular cancer in particular um, and then um, and descended for example testicle that was fixed was fixed a bit later on um, yeah those this particular high risk group maybe we would emphasize having a checkup yeah mm-hmm. but maybe the main main message in here and then you know testicles are external organs so mm. even a one centimeter nodule will be felt will mm. be palpated do not ignore that nodule as small as small as it might be okay yeah. is there a spread factor with testicular cancer like sometimes with lung cancer you see that it'll go into lymph nodes breast cancer the same or is this particular cancer just focused on the testicle itself and could that lead to why you said that uh, the surgery if you remove the testicle you're done yes so for testicular cancer it has its own pattern of spread Mm. so usually starts in the testicle and then grows uh, locally and then the next step it might grow into the lymph node Mm. um, and then it can also spread through the blood now once we reach the level where it spreads uh, spreads through the uh, the blood it can go anywhere it can go to the lungs it can go to the liver it can go to the brain Mm. we've seen quite a number of testicular cancers who come with brain metastasis Mm. and by the way i just want to use uh, success story of one of the most known celebrities, uh, Lance Armstrong, who mm-hmm. is a cyclist. He's not only known for his uh, achievements only, he's also someone who got a testicular cancer with brain, lung, and bone metastasis yeah. in 1996. Yeah. And he just did one year of treatment, and in 1997 he was declared free of cancer. And from there, he started sharing his experience, and then he joined so many groups to increase the awareness about the cancer. So, mm. um, that's how usually testicular cancer spreads and like I said if there is one key message I want people to remember from now is that pick it up an, at an early stage you mm. might just end up having a surgery no chemo no radiation so if it's picked up at a, a very early stage and then uh, things will be much much uh, easier for the patient so it's for the parents for us to be able to pick it up at a very early stage we start with the parents at this particular point when you're taking your child for you know regular checkups vaccines you make sure that you and the health workers are actually checking on number one whether you have undescended uh, testicles that is something to identify exactly and to treat it at that particular uh, to deal with that at that stage so the role of the parents mm. is to work on the risk factor so to prevent cancer it's yeah. prevention so the role of the parents is to pre- prevent their child from mm. being exposed to the risk of having a, a testicular cancer okay yeah. i see a second role not many parents well the way we are brought up i don't know whether it's the same in the west but africans I, I mean, the whole area of the private part is a part where you are taught to avoid playing with touching you know and so that showing then is showing yeah mm. so you grow up just knowing okay so if you're a boy you only use this thing to go on pee pee and you take it back and you do not keep you know t- mm. touching it and now here you are you're saying how shall i notice how shall i notice that there's a lump on my testicles mm. i've got oh. to spend some time there 
Yeah, and then, um, you know, um, even if this was missed at an early ages, or even if it's the, the, the testicles are not undescended, remember the age group of this particular cancer, it's 15 to 35, so yeah. those are people who are sexually active. Mm -hmm. yeah. So sometimes the patient will be, pr the, the, the person will be probably more comfortable talking to the partner, for example. Or sometimes we see cases where the partner is the one who picks up that uh, noodle in the testicles. So mm -hmm. I think around that age, um, people just have to be um, more uh, easygoing and then more um, uh, comfortable going and seek medical attention. They right. are already adults, so they can make that decision on their own. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And so if you're sexually active, actually, also involving your partner in some of these things is important, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. So as a partner, you, you already feel comfortable being naked in front of this person. Exactly. And you already feel comfortable, um, you know, getting into each other's privates. So it's also a responsibility that you have on your partner, isn't mm. it? Yes, correct. That's, that's perfectly correct, yeah. From what you've seen, what are the chances? I mean, and of course, because... Uh, we've talked about then treatment, which in this case is surgical, and then there's no need for any kind of follow-up treatment like chemotherapy and radiation. Is it possible that with the removal of the testicle with that cancer, that it could reoccur? Yes, so that's that's really a good question. So, you know, the earlier the patient presents, the less chances of having a recurrence he will have. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then, you know, when someone comes with a lump, so what, are, what do you do as a healthcare provider? Mm -hmm. First of all, we start with an ultrasound and see, you know, how uh, on a scale of suspicion, how suspicious is this lump? And then there is a simple blood test that we can do. And then also I want people to know that testicular cancer has a, has a tumor marker. Not mm -hmm. all the cancers have a marker. So a very simple blood test. You just draw a blood test, you ask for for alpha fetoprotein, beta HCG, and LDH. Those are the markers for testicular cancer. Mm. Now, if those markers are high, why would a man have a high HCG? Mm. HCG is the pregnancy hormone, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if those markers are high, and then you are suspecting that your patient is having a testicular cancer, and then you go in for a surgery, suspecting that diagnosis, and actually you just need confirmation at the end. Mm. But you go in for a surgery for a testicular cancer. Now, if the markers are high, uh, something else we will need to do is to do a full uh, body workup. So we do a staging workup. We do a CT scan, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, it's not really obligatory, and I know PET scans are available in the country, and mm. now there are many. Mm. So um, uh, there are more than one. For uh, At some point, we had only one PET scan, but now we have more than one. Just a normal CT scan, chest, abdomen, and pelvis in a good uh, radiology department, we mm. will be able to give it a stage. So we do the diagnosis, we confirm it, mm. we assess the tumor markers, that's also part of the risk stratification, mm. and then we do finalize everything, our investigations with the staging. Mm. Now that we have the full picture, we will be able to guide the patient on the outcomes. So early stages, stage one with no elevated tumor markers, those ones will just require uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, if we pick up some lymph nodes based on the size of those Infinites, some patients will require one session of chemotherapy. Mm. Now, if it has spread beyond or the tumor markers are at a high level, and usually the tumor markers are high together with the spread elsewhere, those people will need surgery, followed by um, three to four sessions of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, based on the response following the treatment, you will be able to tell the patients, yes, you ha you're in remission, and then the chances of having a recurrence is usually less than 5%. For the stage one, it's basically, they are almost uh, cured after surgery, so it's 99%. We don't really like the figure where you use 100%, but mm -hmm. they are cured. To be very honest, they are cured, mm -hmm. and we keep following them up later on, and chances of having a recurrence is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, would this you said previously that uh, 
they go back to being or that they go into having a normal life so that means things like fertility reproduction then having going on to have children in the future does it affect that in any way that's a very very good point you're bringing up to discussion so i also want everyone to know that especially for advanced stages so um if we are removing one testicle the, pe the patient will be uh left with one testicle so mm -hmm. in terms of fertility it might be a bit compromised but not that much but for the patients that will really receive chemotherapy their fertility might be compromised from 12 to 20 percent in the future because the chemo will really affect their fertility so i want people to know that in kenya we do what we call cryopreservation so that by the time we make the diagnosis and surgery is done we can assess um, the quality of the sperm and then we offer to our young patients the possibility of cryopreserving their sperm so they can give the sperm and then we just uh, do a freezing, like just on a layman words, we cryopreserve it for mm -hmm. later on when he finishes his mm -hmm. treatment, he would be back to have his normal life. You know, nowadays we don't only, we are no longer in the era where, oh, cancer, it's a, it's a death sentence, yeah. let mm -hmm. us save the patient's mm -hmm. uh, life. No, no, no. We want to save the patient's life. We want to make uh, possible um, make them make it so possible for them to go back to a normal life after there is a life after cancer so mm. we want them to be back to the normal life to anyone uh, to anyone uh, now coming to the cosmetic aspect you know sometimes patients are really bothered by the fact that we remove the testicle mm. there are some uh, prosthesis that we can place in fortunity as of now uh, which is, I mean, it's a shame. It's still considered as a cosmetic procedure, so it won't be covered by... Uh, insurance. Yes, yeah. yeah. Some of the insurances do cover, but then at least the governmental one will not, because it's considered as a cosmetic. But that has a significant impact on the patient's uh, well-being and mental health. Mm. So prosthesis also do exist. We can do uh, that surgery. And then cryopreservation is also important. Those are young patients, so we want them to be back and then, you know, get to found the family, have as many children as, as they want. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, this cancer is manifesting on the testicle itself, mm -hmm. not on the sac. Yes, it's on the testicle, yeah. Not on the sac? Not on the sac, but if it reaches the sac, that means it's locally advanced already, mm. yeah. So as it's, it's already a bad stage? Oh. Yeah, not really a bad stage. Still manageable. Ad, ad, it's yeah, advanced yeah. stage, basically. It's, yes, it's, yes, it's, it's advanced locally stage. advanced. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, testicular cancer, prostate cancer. Yes, that's that's also a good question. So, uh, prostate, it's another organ that is not external. It's internal. It's It sits between the rectum and the bladder. So, it's internal. It's not an organ that we can easily palpate. Mm. Uh, prostate cancer... Um, affects a different age group of patients. The older you get, the higher are the risk of having a prostate cancer. Mm. Prostate cancer is a health system issue in our setting. It's one of the most common uh, cancers mm. in the African ethnicity. Um, it's usually more aggressive and um, it's, um, it, it, um, it shows up with different symptoms. Usually you receive an elderly patient we would say, okay, on the textbook you will find 70 years old, but nowadays we see younger and younger patients, so mm. 50 plus. Uh, someone might come with symptoms such as incomplete voiding, mm. so they want to uh, go for a short, cold, but the, uh, a short cold, but then they are not able to empty fully the bladder. Um, sometimes they come with, um, a, uh, with a bladder uh, urine obstruction, so like complete obstructions. They come, they are like, I want to pee, but I can't. Mm. And we have to catheterize those patients. It can show up with some blood in the urine. Uh, it can show up sometimes with, uh, when it's in advanced stages, lower limb swelling. Uh, sometimes they come with some neck lymph nodes. So those are the, the, the more advanced stages. But usually when we uh, look into the history and then we ask the patients, those urine symptoms have started already. Prostate cancer is also among the cancers that are treatable. Mm. We have several options provided it's picked up at an early stage. So maybe for now, another advice for the, uh, for the older patients, um, 70 plus, but then sometimes even younger when you have a family history of prostate cancer, mm. 
any urine symptom, please do not keep it for yourself. Go and see a urologist. Get yourself examined. Get yourself uh, screened, not particularly for prostate cancer, but at least understand why you're having urine problems. It could mm -hmm. be just benign uh, prostatic hypertrophia, but it could also be prostate cancer. So do not ignore those symptoms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then in this case, it's not, it's, it's, it's impossible for you to confuse one and the other because I mean, totally different, you know, physiological locations, isn't mm -hmm. it? Totally different physiological locations, totally different presentations, totally different age groups, totally different symptoms and and totally different tumor markers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, prostate cancer has a tumor marker as well, mm -hmm. a blood sample. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A blood test, sorry. A blood mm -hmm. test. Okay. So, I mean, again, I'm just going to go back to that age issue because talking about, you know, and I want to look at that age 15 to 20 uh, boys, because we're going back mm -hmm. to testicular cancer now, who for many are involved. Um, and I think you mentioned something to do with this uh, heavily in sports a lot. And it's very possible for any kind of injury to groin occur, injury. a groin injury mm -hmm. that could cause a swelling, right? Um, you said that sometimes that could then, a, a, an injury like that could then... Could trigger. Could trigger. Trigger, yeah. Um, something like that. Is that why we'll say, first of all, protect the groin area during sports? But then if there was an underlying, if there was an underlying issue before that, it wouldn't really matter what you did. And if that injury was to bring that out and it didn't come out before, we would then say there would be absolutely no way uh, for you to know since it's painless and in most cases symptomless unless you have the other uh, issues. The other issues. So just to be uh, very clear that injury is not the instigator of the cancer, mm -hmm. right? So it might have just put an under the light a nodal that has already been there. Mm. So it's not the instigator. Sometimes the patients come and they'll be like, I know it. It's because from that injury in the foot, but now I ended up having a cancer. Yeah. No, it's not a causality. It's not like um, an event that has triggered the cancer. Sometimes it's just coincidence. Like it happens that because of that injury, that young man will go and uh, be seen by a doctor and then the mm. doctor picks it up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but I, mean, I wouldn't say it's a good thing. I wouldn't say it's a bad thing yeah. neither. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in few cases, in few scenarios, it happens. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So if we look at this and then um, the cost of doing a surgery um, like this, if you didn't, would we see, I mean, like you Ag the aggressiveness of the disease of cancer where certain things start to happen and your health system start to fail untreated uh, and you want to do that vis-a-vis -vis. and again I'm comparing because again we talk about cervical cancer unless something goes terribly wrong a lot of people sit with the disease because they don't feel any pain they don't you know have any symptoms mm. in this case and, and and the reasons why we don't go to seek health care is because of the cost right so in this case, um, how expensive is it? What is the burden of the cost of care to get treatment in the form of surgery for testicular cancer? Yeah, so um, thanks for asking that question. Uh, here also I want to send a very important message for everyone, the healthcare providers, the patients, the families, and the normal population. So uh, with cancer, it's, uh, it's, it's a financial burden, to be very honest. Mm. But the earlier you get uh, medical attention, the less the cost will be. So imagine someone coming with a stage one pro, uh, testicular cancer, mm. they will just end up having a surgery. And you know, um, NHF does support. Uh, government hospitals are many. We have so many urologists in the country and they are good urologists. Mm. So the resources are there. And um, if it will be only surgery, and it's usually one of the most easiest surgeries, it's not a major surgery. So like even the hospital stay wouldn't be that prolonged. So imagine the only treatment is just surgery. You go into the hospital, mm. get uh, the problem out, and then you're released, and then you just continue doing your follow-up, clinic mm. follow-ups. While if you just 
watch that noodle growing and then you come with other symptoms, chest cough, uh, headaches, mm -hmm. um, it has affected the brain, mm -hmm. uh, you're not able, you know, your health uh, your head has has really deteriorated. You might be in the hospital for for a long period of time. You receive chemotherapy in the hospital. We need to do some monitoring because if the disease is advanced and then you give the chemotherapy, it might release some toxins. So mm. we need to observe those patients and avoid having any other complication from that release of the toxins. Uh, so that would make things even worse. Chemotherapy is affordable. Mm. NHF does support for chemotherapy. Radiation, NHF does support for radiation. And and we have quite, um, we have improved in the last couple of years. We have mm. so many centers of radiotherapy, oncology departments, cancer departments. So it's available in the private as well as in the public hospitals. Right. So the earlier, the less heavy the burden will be. And know that you will have some support either coming from um, from the private insurances or even from the government one, the national one as mm. well. Yeah. Mm. Dr. Hajj, this is Testicular Cancer Awareness Month, all right? So the public needs to be aware that, number one, there's something called testicular cancer and this is how it manifests and that it's curable to a high degree. Does the health system have awareness? Do the nurses, the clinical officers, the doctors that you'll find at, let's say, level three, level four hospital know as much about testicular cancer as for example you know as an oncologist I would say we are not at the level where we want to be to be very honest because mm. otherwise we wouldn't be seeing advanced stages sometimes when you see the patient come especially from deep rural areas um, you might find that that patient might have sought some attention but then it was just missed mm. so you know other differentials such as um, like benign conditions um, would be brought to discussion and then, you know, the patient will go, he'll be worried about the node and then they'll go, oh, no, it's nothing. It's just a varicose cell. It's just, you know, it's just uh, you had a trauma and then that trauma in a sport or the injury in a sport mm -hmm. might must, uh, might mislead people. So yeah. they'll go, oh, no, 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 it's just from the trauma. It's fine. And then the patient will get reassured. They'll go home, never seek any medical attention until one or two years later. Yeah. So I would say the awareness is not at the level that we want it to. And thanks for bringing in that discussion because uh, through the media that's how we will be able to uh, spread a wider message to a wider population and I believe um, a Spice FM like people listen to Spice FM so thanks for bringing that uh, knowledge to the mm. people and um, I think we should do it more often mm. so that both healthcare providers, because also, you know, the, the first line of healthcare provider are not particularly um, um, oncologists or mm. specialists or urologists. So uh, we try as specialists to reach to them as well, do continuous training. Uh, we, oh, we always do, um, uh, and we usually focus on those awareness months. We always have online uh, conferences, meetings, uh, continuous medical education. Mm. We have our uh, Keisho Kenya Association of uh, uh, hematology and oncology where it's really hard working to make sure that we spread the word not only in Kenya and East Africa so uh, th through those platforms yeah. like the media the um, our own uh, medical platforms we can spread the word through the population the patients but then also the healthcare providers mm. <laughs> yeah and we thank and you very much for coming in today. maybe just one last word yes I would say uh, nowadays you know cancer is really the the, the, the cancer there is some people call it an outbreak of cancer mm. so please keep in mind cancer as one of the differentials never ignore that possibility when you're examining a patient or even as a patient when you see uh, something abnormal mm. you know a bleed a growth those are abnormal things mm. so you really need to keep it in mind and then the earlier you go to a, a healthcare um, provider the earlier the disease will be detected, the better the outcomes, mm. the less financial burden, and then the less uh, toxic and heavy treatment you will receive. Dr. Manel Hajj, consultant medical oncologist from the Aga Khan University Hospital, has been our guest. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.